Um, welcome along to our latest um, seminar in the School of Social Work and Social Policy seminar series. It's great to have you all here today. Um, my name is Gillian McIntyre and I'm a senior lecturer in the, the school. Um, and it's a real privilege for me to be chairing this session today. Um, so in today's session, that we have a panel of four people who are going to be talking to you um, about their experience of recording outcomes. Um, so today's session is entitled um, Friend Not Foe, Making the Case for Meaningful Recording in Social Services. So this is a really vital topic for social work practice. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about it. So the panel today are going to consider how we can properly capture and ensure a focus on what matters to people via social work records. So I want to start off by introducing you to today's panel. Um, first of all, we have Ailey Shearer, who is a project worker in the fourth ballet team at Includem. Um, which is a Scottish charity working with children and young people and families to transform their lives. It's great to have Ailey here with us today. She's um, one of a team of Includem staff who's engaged as a participation worker and is exploring how recording can support participation. Also with us today is Kerry Llewellyn. And it's great, thank you and welcome along Kerry. Kerry is Managing Director at All Care Scotland, which is a business which has been in her family since 1993. Kerry represents domiciliary care providers and care workers nationally through Care Forum Wales. And she's committed to making a difference to people's lives and would like to see a reduction in task and time recording in home care. So I think we're going to have a really um, interesting discussion today. Moving on to our next panellist, who is Nick Andrews. And Nick um, is a, a registered social worker and he's got many years experience in social work, social care and social work education across children and adult services. And he has been working since 2013 in the School of Health and Social Care at Swansea University. So it's great to have you with us uh, today, Nick, and welcome along. And finally, I'm really pleased to introduce you to my friend and colleague, um, Emma Miller, who is based um, here in the School of Social Work and Social Policy. Emma is also a registered social worker and she obtained her PhD in 2004. Um, and she has worked in a, a, a range of different positions where she kind of blends research policy and practice around the theme of personal outcomes in children and adult services. And her work has had a really significant impact um, in policy and practice in Scotland and the UK more um, broadly. So great to, to have Emma with us today. And I'll now hand over to Emma um, to start off the presentation, just to see if people have questions as we progress through the presentation, please do feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll keep an eye on the chat as we go. Um, and we will make sure that we leave say 15, 20 minutes at the end for discussion. So over to you, Emma. Uh, thanks very much, Gillian, and thanks to very much to the panellists for their patience and preparing for the seminar today and for everyone who's managed to make it along. Um, so we're going to do like a short presentation between Nick and myself about the background to this work on recording. And then we have a pre-recorded video of Ailey and Kerry talking about their experiences of recording in practice. Um, and then hopefully we'll have enough time for a decent discussion at the end. Um, so just to um, start with the end, I suppose that Nick and I uh, have recently worked with Social Care Wales to produce a resource to support recording in social services. And that resource is called Friend Not Foe. And we'll tell you more about that resource at the end. But really before that, to give a bit of context and 
Um, from Friend Not Foe, though, we have made a few short videos to make um, some of the learning about recording and social services more accessible to practitioners in particular. And amongst the five videos are two individual stories and about the impact of recording on people's lives. And so I'm hoping that we this can is one of two personal story videos now. in our series to support the written resource Friend Not Foe. The resource was produced to support meaningful outcome-focused recording. This is Fran's story, titled It Was Gold. It really was. Fran's story supports the principle of outcome-focused recording from cradle to grave. Fran tells us about accessing his records as an adult from his adoption as an infant. Fran never met his birth parents. He lived in a Barnardo's children's home for the first few years of his life. He still has difficult memories of that time. Fran ended up being fostered by a couple who then adopted him at the age of 16. He didn't look for his birth parents as he didn't want to upset his new family. Later, Fran left home, got married and had children of his own. When he was in his 30s, he decided to look up his birth records, so he made an appointment with Barnardo's to go and read his file. Fran told us that reading his file was an amazing experience. Three things stood out for Fran. Firstly, he found out that his mum knew everything that had happened to him, as it had been recorded by the social worker right through. Lots of things had happened to him. He had been in trouble with the police and at one point had been stabbed. It meant a lot to Fran that his mum knew about his life. Fran describes himself as quite a respectable artist. He does painting with Formula One teams. The second thing that stood out for Fran from his record was that his mum was a brilliant artist. He was very excited by that discovery because of the connection he felt to his mum. The third thing that stood out for Fran was that for the first time in his life, he saw a picture of himself as a baby. It reminded him of his son as a baby with a Mohican haircut. Fran was grateful to the social worker who took the time to record that information. It filled a gap for him and he told us it was gold. It really was. Okay, so that I just wanted to, although these resources aren't finished yet, they're still draft. Um, I got agreement from uh, Jess at Social Care Wales to share one story with you because we wanted to bring a, a real person's experience into the seminar. So um, moving on to just thinking in more general terms about why recording in not just social services, but broader human services is really important. Um, and I have to say that this list on the right hand side of the slide is a cut down from a much longer list. I took another two points off even this morning because I think, you know, when you start thinking about the potential benefits uh, of recording, they are really significant. Um, there's that bit about the, the record telling the individual story where recording systems allow that to happen and, and how important it is to have the story to be able to refer to and share with others. And the bit about recording being a memory aid and that in fact, unless we have people's stories recorded in our systems, how we are, can possibly remember one individual from all the others that we're supporting is, is impossible. There's also something about having the time to record, um, being able to reflect on practice and how that can support analysis being really important. And also where we think about recording a plan, how that plan can provide a sense of direction for everybody, um, particularly important to have, and that's why it's particularly important to have the person's view in the plan, and how that plan can provide a touch point to refer back to when things get complicated. Where was it we started from? What did we agree we were going to do in the first place? Also for um, the record is really important for sharing with other agencies, um, how are we going to work together to support what this person says is important to them in their lives? And of course, there's the accountability aspects as well, although that can get, make things complicated, but there is that evidence of discussions and activity. And I guess there's the bit about, you know, it's, it's about recording informs decision making at the individual level, but also if we look at our records as a whole, ideally we have good enough data that supports um, decision making at the collective level, at the service level as well. Um, and something about I, every interaction being important and 
and how the record helps us to, to, to keep a record of what matters from those interactions. And I think so some of the work we've done on building evidence around recording and its impact, um, we published an article in British Journal of Social Work just a couple of years ago, which shows how in the context of a carers organisation, that the record was used by practitioners to help to build trust and relationships with the carers they supported. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in the video that we show later too. So, why is recording so difficult? There are a lot of reasons for that, um, and a lot of them are system-based um, issues. So for a lot of practitioners, when they're recording, they're thinking about potential legal cases in the future, and so thinking for that potential audience. There's also a big issue about fear of raising expectations in interactions with people. And so when we think about outcome-focused practice, um, there's a huge issue that we all talk about, which is moving from being a fixer to a facilitator. So there's something about it's not necessarily the organization's job to fix everything that's raised. But if someone says something is important, we should pay attention to that, whether we are in a position to fix it or not. Eligibility criteria are a huge factor for um, staff and social services. Um, about thinking about um, having to make the case for what's wrong with the person in order to make the case for resource. And actually what we're trying to get to with recording is a more strengths-based approach, what's going well with this person and what is it they want to achieve, not just what's going wrong. And the list goes on. Performance criteria tend not to um, value what's important to people. That is usually going to be about relationships. Um, it tends to be more about throughput and um, speed of in, uh, work and so on. Then we have commissioning and contract management with still a tendency to focus on task and time, which I know is a long-term bugbear of carries in the care at home sector. There are some shifts to more meaningful commissioning, but um, there's a long way to go with that. And perhaps also a tendency for the medical model to still predominate. For example, we wouldn't even consider that somebody's biopsy results wouldn't be held in the record. So why is what matters most to them about their life not considered important to record as well? And there's just that bit about um, time to think and talk for practitioners being really important and time to record being the need to make space for time to recording. And an understanding that if we have better outcomes for practitioners, that, was, that translates into better outcomes for people. So just switching from recording in general to very, very briefly think about um, personal outcomes at the centre of this, because that's where Nick and I have um, combined our work over the last few years. Um, and to think about what we mean by personal outcomes, that um, if you're focusing on outcomes, because it is a bit of a jargon word, it means that you're supported to identify what is important to you in your life, including what's going well as where the difficulties are. But I guess with the outcomes, but it's really more getting into why are these things important? So not just um, what in terms of activities and going on holiday, for example, but actually why does that matter to you? So understand, because a holiday can mean very different things to very different people. If we understand what that holiday means for that person, then we can make better decisions with them about the best way to go with that. And of course, with planning, you're also then looking at not just where is it you want to get to or what is it you want to maintain, but who's going to be involved in that and how are we going to work together to get there. So the exchange model is absolutely fundamental to that. It's from social services research from the 1990s, but it still holds as true now as when it was developed. And there's something in all of this about understanding how we work with an individual, their family, where that's relevant, with the social services staff and other staff if they're involved too, but also understanding the organisation's perspective. So considering things like duty of care or what resources may be available within the organisation. And there's something about the complexity of bringing all of that together through the negotiation with the person to agree their outcomes. So just very, very brief, briefly then thinking about the types of outcomes that we're talking about here. So there's the maintenance outcomes, which are, and this goes back to the Social Policy Research Unit, again from the 1990s at York University. 
So maintenance or quality of life outcomes, the things that matter to all of us about feeling safe, having meaningful things to do, um, seeing people and being as well as you can be. So those things that matter to everybody. And then there are the time limited or change outcomes, which are really more about where somebody's had some kind of crisis, perhaps a hospitalization. And it's about restoring some of the things that might have been lost. So for example, managing symptoms or improving confidence or, or skills that might need to be regained, for example. So there already you have two types of outcome. And then we have the process outcomes, which can often be overlooked. But again, going back to the concept of the importance of relationships in practice, that process outcomes can often be the things that people will just talk about most when they describe their interactions with services. So that fundamental importance of being listened to, of being treated with respect, being, being valued, and so on. And so really when we're thinking about personal outcomes, it's about blending all of these. And I guess if we think back to 2012, when we produced, we, at that time we talked about um, talking points as the initiative where we brought together all our learning at that point about an organizational approach to embedding outcomes. And there's really three components to that. So there's the conversation, with the person, that kind of strength-based, outcome-focused, where do you want to get to? How do we work together to get there? And then we realized quite earlier on there needed to be a separate focus on recording because even when the conversations are happening, our systems tend to drive things back towards a deficit focus. And so somehow that person's voice gets lost in translation. So a lot of work has been focused on that in the recent years. And then, of course, there's the third bit that I mentioned at the beginning about ideally what you would want to be doing is being able to look at those records and look at what matters to people, where are we doing well with achieving what matters to people and where are the gaps and using that information for decision making at a more collective level. And there are pockets of progress in that realm, but there's still a lot of work to do. And just, I think that um, some of the ideas about measuring outcomes are just really, again, really briefly, just to touch on key learning points in relation to measurement of outcomes and the limitations and how maybe there's some issues about the language that we use. First of all, to think about um, contributions towards outcomes rather than attribution. It's almost impossible to nail down that activity X or resource Y directly achieved a particular outcome. Life is much messier than that. And so thinking about different contributions to outcomes makes it much more reasonable and possible to do. Um, also regarding measurement, um, I think measuring outcomes is probably not that helpful a concept. Uh, more recently, if you moved to talking about tracking outcomes, which allows for the messiness um, of how things actually play out in life, the outcomes can improve, but then they can decrease again. And so things tend to change over time and maybe tracking is a more useful way of thinking about outcomes in the context of people's real lives. And we had a project a few years ago called Meaningful and Measurable, which attempted to kind of navigate the complexity of measurement on the one hand and more narrative approaches to recording on the other hand. And one of the key findings from that project was that higher scores are not necessarily always what you're looking for, that sometimes um, maintaining an outcome with somebody can be a really significant achievement or indeed slowing the rate of deterioration of an aspect of quality of life despite um, health conditions. So I think there's, there's a need to shift away from the, this pressure and an idea that scores always have to increase. So just a little bit on the Meaningful and Measurable project, which was funded by the ESRC, and um, we published a report on that 2015, but um, one of the things was we started out that project with the idea that we were going to look at the records of eight different organisations, which will he were health and social care. And uh, in reality, when people started looking at the records, all kinds of contradictions and unexpected uh, challenges arose. And um, Karen Barry came up with the concept of it was like almost lifting a rock 
when we looked at the records and all these kind of beasties started crawling out, showing us where the contradictions were. And at that point, I'm going to hand over to Nick, who's based at Swansea, and uh, Wales were a partner in the Meaningful and Measurable project. And so, Nick, do you want to say a little bit more about your... Yeah. Yeah, not not a lot really. Um, I mean, the the thing thing to me about the whole thing is it, it's become this. It can become this monster, can't it? Because it's this machine, and of course, it, people try to try to reduce something that's really complicated into something simple. I think the reductionist approaches to sort of measuring outcomes and all of that has created this um, oppressive system, hasn't it? Really, that's what came. From. One of the key things for us was you know, there's all this talk about creating good outcomes for the people we work with. By, and practitioners were just worn to the ground by the, some of the bureaucracy. So, and some of the systems which were clunky and they didn't fit. And um, I always think a nice example of, is um, the work and Kerry who could talk more about this in home care because um, the recording for home care is onerous and burdensome and it's all around task and everything. Yet when I had conversations with home care workers, uh, we talk about their magic moments. They have all these stories, and all this rich narrative of how they're changing lives, which um which actually aren't written anywhere. And, and actually they hide a lot of it because we had this phrase, undercover kindness came out where um, staff are doing the right thing by people. They're doing an outcome focused approach, but because it doesn't quite fit with what was recorded in the care plan, they almost are almost embarrassed by the fact that they're doing right. And so I, I don't want to go into a lot of time, but I just think we need a, 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 an approach that goes much more with the flow and the grain of humanity really, really run trying to fit humanity into the, the machine. So, um, well, there you go. What makes a good outcomes, a distinction between outcomes, outputs, personalised, person has a role in their own language. One area I'm really interested in here is, is much more into storytelling approaches. And particularly, I think one of the things I'm, again, I don't go off on a tangent, but I'm really interested in review. I think we undervalue review process. We're often so preoccupied with the assessment and then review is something that's done by a sort of lesser qualified person. And yet a lot of all of the work around emergent community development where you're trying to change lives a lot of outcomes are unanticipated unexpected and you need to reflect back and I think there's something we've got to be much more savvy about how we approach you know rather than thinking we can predict and control everything and then measure it it's almost like I think there's a lot more we need to do about looking backwards and reflecting backwards rather than planning forwards so the friend not foe is, is a, a, a guidance we we developed. It was lovely working with them. It was it was a, one of those lovely blissful moments pre-pandemic. In fact, I think it was the week or two before the pandemic. Emma and I did a tour of Wales, but we went around with social and we had three events, regional events, and we explored some of these really deep issues with um people around recording. And, and anyway, we've developed and refined and tested with them uh, this, this this friend not for guidance, which again we'd invite you to have a look at and and critique really and see what you think. Um, but I'm conscious of the time, so I'm probably not going to say a lot more about that. So I'm going to hand over back to Emma. Oops, um, that's just some um, references um, based on all the work we've been talking about and the Personal Outcomes Network website. I'm happy to share the slides with anyone who wants them afterwards. But the most important bit of the presentation is actually, um, this is based on a pre-recorded Zoom call that the four of us had um, a few weeks ago. And so we've cut some of the, um, the wisdom of Kerry and Ailey into a short 15 minutes video. So I'm now going to hopefully play the video and you'll be able to hear um, Kerry and Ailey's voices um, talking about their experience of recording. So here we go, hopefully. I think that it's, it can be sometimes difficult because you're where well, you're treading that 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 zone anyway where sometimes you'll be working with a family where they they don't feel that they need your service and um at different times like the, the things that you're trying to do with them they're they're not making them very happy because you might be showing up and they might not be in the mood to, you know that they might you might be trying to encourage them to do things like if, if it's you know, change maybe behavior that that they want to change, but actually that process is really difficult. So um you know if you're getting feedback which is really really negative then you're having to sort of I think it's easier than to be transparent about right okay this is where we're at this is where the issue is is that you know we have to go through that process together if we're gonna like agree on this sort of document that I've got that's maybe the report or their support plan like what I'm taking out is because we have to say right okay 
here's why I'm here. Here is, do you agree with that to start off with? Like, <laughs> yes, no, I'm on board with the goal. So if we don't get further than that stage, then at least we know where we're at. Whereas you could sort of be trying to say, oh, we're doing this and we're doing like drugs and alcohol work or we're doing sort of like risk taking and offending and all these different things. But it's, it's not going to be meaningful if you don't have that shared understanding and the shared goal, really. So it sort of forces me anyway to hash that out with them and to see like, okay, do you agree with this here? And then you have to write, okay, what do you want to change about that? What's your expectations of us so that you can be on the same page so that you're working together and you're not working at cross purposes? One of the most enlightening things that happened to me is at the start of our outcomes pilot is I wrote this report and it was my report and although I'd gathered the views of people I very much put my interpretations in there of why this worked better and whatever and one of the people that I did a pen picture of he was an alcoholic and um, had MS and we totally almost his outcomes he wanted to achieve was to be able to do more to go out more he wanted to give back to the community so he was a treasurer of the ms society locally and he needed to be able to attend more things and we managed all of those things but as a consequence his alcohol um, dependency improved and he we would frequently cancel evening and afternoon calls because we'd turn up and he wasn't in any state for staff to even stay they'd have to be two of them and it was a just check you're all right and out because you know of, of the way he was and we, and we noticed this changing, this whole thing changed. So I wrote a little paragraph and said, and another outcome that we didn't all agree together was that um, Mr. So-and-so had um, reduced alcohol um, dependency. We've noticed a difference and we've also able to provide a better quality service that, that's more value for money because you're not paying us not to be there. So I wrote all this, all oh, look great. And then at the end, the council said, right, we're going to share that report. And I went, oh, but those people will see what I've written about them. I wrote about another one's relationship with their family and how that has improved and how that had changed their lives as well. And I went, oh, I haven't had those conversations with these people. Like, that's my observation of it. And they said, well, this is, if we're going to do it real, we'll show it to the people like, exactly like you said, Amy, and we're going to say, are you happy for everyone to see that? And it was quite an uncomfortable thing for me that, that they were going to get to see this, but I agreed. And you know what? It, it was fine. Nobody had a problem with it. And that, that was quite um, a refreshing moment to know that we could be that transparent and probably added value to everything. So I was thinking as well, because a lot of the, when we, it's the refocusing, and for me, because I'm, you know, not that experience I've not been in this role very very long time so when I first start off I'm, I'm very aware of like like what I'm doing and recording is about sort of people above me it's about me sort of sort of justifying what I'm doing recording what I'm doing and then the longer I've been in the job I'm more but it's not that's not really important like do, does the family have a copy of this this plan does it do they have it written down what the outcomes are like have they reviewed the outcomes like it's it's about them because if you want to your engagement and your recording to be meaningful it's actually a record of like what we're trying to do together where we're at in the journey where we're going in the journey like and and for you to actually sit down and make something which is recorded and then for that to be sort of stored as a piece of evidence that needs to be used by whoever's going to need to use that evidence a service level um you know that's where I've shifted because obviously when you start it is it's a sense of like recording is about complying with something it's about evidencing for something that's overseeing what you do but reshifting like refocusing that um onto what's the point of actually recording what we're doing here you're trying to record something that's like your involvement in somebody's life over quite a, a long period of time and, and why that's why you're there so in order for that to be meaningful and like moving towards evidencing what I'm doing and, and shared sort of documents or, or pieces of like work or, or a plan that has got points that's agreed and and um, that's got people's input into it like so that's how it's shifted for me anyway. I think it'll carry 
So I think that what we try to do is we always, if we are writing a report, we're writing a report for a, a meeting with social workers or a children's panel or something like that. So you would take uh, the report out and you would go over it with them before the meeting as good practice so that there, there isn't that sense of being surprised in a meeting about something that's been said. So I think that it's that there's a real kind of, there's it's, it's really quite difficult sometimes to, to be able to build really good relationships with people where you're having to really acknowledge that there's things that are not good here maybe so it's things like child protection concerns um and so i think through going writing a report and me in one mode where i'm writing a report and i'm writing in that formal language and i'm, I'm thinking in a different way and then printing this out and then taking this out and then reading it through with the family and it just being like alienating in a way and um, just for them to read to read about themselves like I hate like, reading about myself, like, I, uh, you know, like getting a report card, really, like, and thinking that this person's been coming out and assessing you, like the whole, it's so shaming to read about yourself. Um, so I think that um, it's important, I think, in the way that you write it is, it's, it's got to be done in really sensitively, but I think the key part about it is, is getting that, that proper transparency and being open right at the beginning. And that's why, you know, the recording of, you know, the, the support plan letters that, that I would have done are separate to maybe reports that I have to submit to external bodies and things like that. But that in there should be detailed why we're both here, like we both right at the beginning can acknowledge, you know, that this is maybe the issue here and this is why we're here to sort of support, to support you. And it's not that it's been done to you, we want to work with you. So let's both, first of all, agree on what we can do for you and then you're you're never then going sort of back on a false pretense of when you've like shown up saying hey I'm here to build a relationship to support you and then sort of waiting for all these things to kind of come out um, and then you're sort of they feel a little bit like betrayed almost by you if you're then having to sort of go over the report with them and say yeah yeah you know we want you to be together as a family but you know here are concerns that we have that we have to highlight um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to do that sometimes. I think it's like getting in there really early with having them be part of that process collaboratively, then you, you avoid a lot of that tension. I always say to everyone, don't hide anything, because if I get a phone call of complaint, it would normally be off a family member because we've done something that they don't think should happen then, or they feel, you know, we've got all those family tensions about the guilt of not doing things and then somebody else doing it, or they get a bit worried that their people are getting too close or whatever. So if I know about that, I can instantly put someone's mind at rest on a phone call by going, yes, I know all about that. They checked it out with me. We did this, which is a very different conversation to a family member phoning up and saying, did you know this happened to me going, no, let me look into it. Because that already changes the narrative then. If it's all there and we've got it on our screen to say what's fine, these things don't become an issue. Is that and we do have to justify certain things and, and you know you do have learned experience that makes you have to do that but that still doesn't need to be onerous if it's the right thing at the right time and that's only about training the staff and helping them understand and if you've got prior experience you can I've had um, a POVA investigation because somebody threw cottage cheese out without gaining consent to do so even though it was very out of date and a risk once you've been down that route, you just alert people to what they, you know, it's quite simple. You always check with someone and or if you if you feel that person, it doesn't mean you've always got to put the cottage cheese down as an issue. But it depends where that person's line is, isn't it? If them and their family don't care and they say do what you like, then you don't need to record it. But with anyone you think it might be an issue, that's knowing them, then you're going to record it. Somebody with a small memory issue, you might record more so that you can say, yes, I I've got it written here so they can see that themselves and help them to remember it. So that, again, is about recording. They love, they say um, a proportionate. That's CIW's lovely way of describing it, isn't it? It's a proportionate approach. It's also rich, isn't it? That's what it comes over to me. It's complex, it's dynamic, and, and, and that's... And the way we do recording generally is is, is, is simplistic, isn't it? And it's sort of, and it lives in this sort of Nordian toyland world where 
everything goes according to plan and everyone's lovely to everyone and <laughs> I don't know. It's Stick. Um, I'm about that because I do think that there's a lots of families we have worked with for over a year you know you can be working with like sometimes like a teenage boy that I'd, I'd worked with who you would go around to the house and knock on the door like for months and they'd say get lost in not so polite terms and you went back and you went back but the key part of that was having that relationship with the social worker like they understood and they they didn't think that we are wasting all this money on a service here and nothing is happening and then after eight months with that young person they started coming out and they achieved you know they they, they, they participated they used the time with us to to get a kind of award that they could get because we were working with other services who could offer you know like due to the edinburgh award and things like that and um, for doing certain modules so like help get them a sense of achievement in that but there was a long period where you, know, you could say nothing's happening. <laughs> you know, when somebody says, I want to be able to go outside and I can't because I'm in a wheelchair, you will know that it doesn't matter when you put the ramp in and you get a chair that will go over the ramp, that it's not that that's stopping them actually, that it's their confidence, that it's their, and, and so you have to unpick all those things, but yeah, they don't expect us to do that as part of our service really. They're delighted when we do, but that's not really an aim or a, you know, because you can't pin that on someone. The reason we go in is because they physically can't get to their bathroom. That's, that's the reality. Mm. It's a very different thing, isn't it? And it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear you talk about how people do recognise that you're going to need to be in there an awful lot longer to achieve results, whereas some of the results they expect of us are like quite instant results because we're in there doing it. But that's what makes our outcomes focus working so exciting because nobody can believe what other things we're achieving because of it. And it comes back to you. Yeah, like I think that you're you're right about why are we recording, Kerry, and 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 what what are we doing that for, and is that running sometimes that cross purposes with what we were trying to do with the family or, or anything like that? I mean, I mean that as um, you know sometimes we want to say okay, well we do want to record stories. We want that to be meaningful because we want this for for proving why we want to do the work that we want to do, why it's it's useful, why it's good. Um, and I think that the participation of the, the young people, the families or, or, or that in that is just so important because it, it achieves both those ends, like because then you're you're making sure that you're not like misrepresenting things. You're not um if you know if they're present in that if you're able to capture them in an image in their words and you know something that they have done then you're able to make it meaningful for people but also you're making sure that you're not just sort of twisting twisting data and creating data and you're not also telling stories as well in the sense that you're you're, you're telling tales and you're you're sort of spinning what you've done with people into tales as well you're you're just letting people's voices come through and it's about how do we I think use the tools that we have to sort of create channels for people's voices to come through um, and how do you make that practical so rather than sort of sitting down and writing a log of everything that you've done and, and in minute detail which is what a lot of people do I think because they're not certain about what they need to record uh, you know there, there's not a lot of sometimes the clarity in people's minds about what is you know it, for them it's if they're thinking I need to record everything in case somebody looks into this so they just blah, and they write they like reams and reams of information or if they're trying to sort of capture an outcome in that if they're maybe you know a lead worker in our case who's maybe trying to pull things out then you can end up putting things in boxes and things like that uh, and you know all those problems I think can be mi minimised if you just have more channels for getting people's voices in there. Okay, so that's the um, end of the um, the discussion with uh, Ailey and Kerry. Um, so I'll hand back to you, Gillian. Okay, thanks, Emma. And thank you, everyone, um, for a really fascinating presentation.